Okay. You speak into here. No, this. Oh. This is for like the teacher. Okay. I'll take care of that. All right, folks, are we live? Yep, I think so. Boom. Is that Tara Lynn? Yeah. Ava, you there? Yes. Ava, you there? Yes. What's happening? Okay. Just checking in on if there's anybody else joining in right now. There's a couple others. Sammy Worley. Hang on. Sammy, you there? Hey, hey. Sammy, you there? Turn off your mic. Turn on your microphone. Ask to unmute. Okay. Is that you, Sammy? Yeah. What's happening? How's it going? I'm good. How are you? All good. Terry, are you still there? Terry Lynn? What do you prefer to be called? Terry Lynn or Terry? Honestly, whatever's easier for you. No worries. Is that how it's pronounced, though, Terry Lynn? Uh, Terry Lynn. Yeah. Terry Lynn. Okay. Sammy, Ava. Okay. We're going to get going. So behind me, this is Coach Ashley. She is. Satter College Director in Training, so she'll be on a lot of the calls with us. Um, she knows more than a thing or two about the system. So read through some of you guys' questions. Um, kind of the way this will work is, uh, one, I'll kind of give you guys the layout right now of how it'll generally work. And then um, as we get through the sessions, there will be a 15 minute intermission in the middle. So you guys can go away, have a break, go to the bathroom, uh, get some more questions for our Q&A section, that sort of thing. So. Each week, um, I'll go through whatever questions the group has and uh, essentially make sure that those get answered. And then beyond that, um, I'll always have a plan for the things that we'll go over. So today we'll spend some time on uh, rotation one and rotation two, some kind of generic rotations, some good ideas of some things to do inside of there, some things to think about as a coach, as a player, as an athlete, as a parent, things like that. So. I'm just jumping on, so anybody who wasn't in the, the group thread earlier, are there any specific things, uh, either whether you guys had emailed them or didn't email them that you're wanting to learn or go over or converse about, anything like that? I think my big, biggest thing is just kind of getting an idea for the different types of, I'll say lingo and language that different clubs and different coaches use because I grew up playing in Northern California and I live in Southern New Mexico and the coaches out here use totally different terms than I've ever heard. And they're like, that's how it is universally. And I'm like, not what I've ever heard. So I'm just interested to see how other people do it. So I can just kind of get more of an understanding overall. For sure. How about you, Sammy? Um, I would say the same thing. Um, I mean, I grew up in Hawaii and I came to Alabama for volleyball. So it is, I would say, kind of behind here on a lot of things. And I want to be able to get more experience elsewhere. Okay, no doubt. How about you, Miss Ava? Just anything. I'm here to learn anything. <laughs> girl. So for those of you who don't know, Ava comes to our Center College camps a lot. Uh, she's, a, she's an athlete at our camps pretty often. So. She generally tries to make the trip to wherever we are. So dedicated set of college athlete. Okay, so um, so you guys have this understood. Uh, if you have notebooks or notepads or anything like that, kind of write this down. 
Um, the way that it'll break down is during the first portion, I'll go through about a half an hour. Uh, you guys can call it a lecture, but it'll be active. Like you'll get to see stuff um, over here. So I'll go over whatever our programming is for the day. You guys are more than welcome to ask questions during that. So it's not like, wait, I have to sit here and just write down my questions and Chris will answer them later. Like you can ask during. So that's kind of why Lynn's here. If I'm far away from the camera, she'll just relay it to me and then I'll come over and explain it or whatever the case. And then if there's uh, any kind of, like I'll always communicate. If there's a tangent, like, it's, for example, if I'm talking about rotation one and I say, this is like a typical thing in rotation one. This is what we'd call sets. These are some options for a setter. This is why I would choose to have a person pass versus not pass. Uh, and you guys are like, well, what rotations is that changing? Sometimes I'll say, boom, here's the quick answer, but write that down for the Q and A. Sometimes I'll say, let's hit that in the Q and A, write it down. And sometimes I'll answer it right then. So kind of have your notepads ready for things like that. Um, all tangent if it's a good time to tangent if it's not a good time to tangent we're running out of zoom time like we'll save it for the second session um and then the second session so you guys know in advance will be intro by q a so you guys will ask like whatever questions you have so far from what we've talked about anything that branches off from there uh, goes to you know some different subject or whatever the case like well is there a difference between indoor and beach well when I was growing up, I was taught this. Is that right? Is that wrong? Whatever the case, those are kind of the typical questions we get. So, um, is any of that, does all that make sense? Cool. Ava, y'all good, Mama? Can't see your face. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, we'll start this way. Uh, let's talk a little bit about lingo. So, in the, the way that I'll describe the levels, and you guys can write this down for future reference. I'll always talk about one of two categories. So I'll, you'll either hear me say level one, level two, level three. And so a level one to me would be anybody who's at the beginner to early JV-ish level, like kind of in America, an average JV level down to beginner. That's like a level one. If, if you guys ever hear me say at level one or at the beginner level. To me, a level two would be anybody who is just getting into that varsity range, just starting to, to be, you know, in, in the conversation for varsity or is like on varsity solidified. So kind of that universal, obviously like varsity may be different in the highest league in California than it is, you know, in Wyoming, but anybody in that kind of like I could play varsity sports range, varsity volleyball. And then a level three to me would be anybody who has the potential to play at like the division one or on down to like division two level. Cause I would, I would say that a division three is pretty close to like a high caliber varsity team um, in like a California, for example. So th that's going to be how I differentiate the three levels. So if you guys ever hear me say like a quick level one, level two, level three, you guys can always go back to those original notes. Like, okay, what level is he talking about? So that being said, that is also where I would differentiate some of the, some of the terminology and communication. So for example, in a lot of places, you'll hear the left side set, the high left side set called a four or a hut or something like that. And then on the right side, they'll call it a five or high. And then the back row, you'll hear like pipe, or things of that nature. So different places call it different things, you know, and obviously lingo is not only set based, like lingo is really all the skills and all the kind of communication. So I would say more often, you know, at the lower level is when things tend to be the same. So there is like, okay, this is a four, or this is a five, or this is a pipe. Or at the higher level is when I really see names start to get differentiated. Like me, for example, my teams purposefully, when I write systems books, so uh, a, a systems book is like my te every team I've ever coached, they literally get a handout of like 11 pages and it breaks down exactly how we run our system. Like, so there's zero questions. Like, where are we passing the ball? How do we set up with our arms? What is this set called? What's that set called? In transition, what's our footwork? What are we supposed to do if it's a great situation as a hitter? What should we do if it's not a great situation? Like, so that there's no questions and the people who are more studious, they can go home and study it kind of thing. How's it going, Gabe, you with us? 
Gabe, whenever you get set up, just uh, holler or wave. Can you hear us, Gabe? Yes, I can. Boom. Hey, welcome. Okay, so I was just going over with everybody. You can bust out your notebook or notepad if you have one. Um, I was going over with everybody. We we're talking about terminology um, in a quick rundown. You'll have to kind of come back to the video when we post it later. But a level one is, to me, is anybody from the beginner to a JV level. Um, a level two is anybody either just beginning varsity or solidified like varsity starter anywhere in the country. And to me, a level three would be anybody who has the potential to be able to uh, perform at the division one two level in college. And technically, I do have a level four, but that's professional formal player stuff. So we won't talk about that. Okay. Right. Um, so we were going over lingo. We're starting to have a conversation about lingo. And I was telling everybody that um, I have found that usually at the level one uh, level that people tend to have pretty consistent lingo in terms of how things are named and how things are called. So um, a four on the left side, a five on the right side, a pipe out of the back row, a one, you know, a quick attack or a two ball kind of thing. And I've noticed that at a higher level is when the set names typically change. And I was sharing with everybody that um, myself, for example, I purposefully uh, call my sets different things that other teams wouldn't be able to pick up on. So I, I literally create a systems book where our system is completely different terminology that, that the opponent wouldn't understand. And the reason that I do that is so that we can just have a little bit of an edge on the opponent. And if my attackers are calling for routes, I don't want the opponent to have a good understanding of what they're trying to run. Like if we're running something inside or we're running something faster or we're running something quicker versus slower, I don't want the opponent to be able to have a good understanding of what my people are talking about. So I, I will, for example, I've used to, I've, for my most recent system, rather than calling something on the left side, like a four or a hut or a high, uh, I would have my team say um, a two fast. And two means that we're gonna be on our second step. And you're just supposed to know as the setter that I'm the left side hitter or on the right side, they would also call two fast. So that would mean that they're on their second step and my setter is just supposed to know that they're a right side hitter in that situation. Or in past teams, I've called things like red, white, blue, but that talks about where the set is along the net rather than what the speed of the set is. Or I'll have something be called the same exact thing and just add a word at the end to decipher what speed it is. So. Uh, one season I had a team run. So if you like imagine a net and here's the left side of the net, here's the right side of the net, I would have A, B, middle, C, D. And we would call it an A fast, an A tempo and an A high to simulate like this is in on the left side, but it's high first step tempo. Tempo means second step tempo, fast means third step tempo. B fast, tempo, high middle fast tempo high c fast tempo high for example so uh some other frequent terminology i want to hear from you guys you know what are some things that you've heard sets called and what other questions do you have on terminology and lingo i'd say one thing that really threw me off when i came to new mexico to the coach was um the varsity coach uses for back sets instead of calling them fives like I've always heard them. He letters them A through D, and it's just a matter of whether it's a tight back one all the way up to a high back set. So right. that was unique to me. Okay. How about you, Sammy? Um, when I play club at home, we would call our sets by like the front row would be areas one through nine, and you'd call it by the Hawaiian um, word like number for that. So like a high outside set would be a lua, which is like second tempo kind of set. Okay. But I would say at Alabama, they're all um, pretty general, fours, fives. Yeah. Okay. Gabriel, have you had any, Gabe, have you had any kind of experience with different set titles? Yeah, I guess um, the biggest thing for me, like I just started working like with people that, you know, even know about like you were talking about like the different levels, like so, you know, people knowing how to run, you know, different plays and running ones through fives and stuff. And 
um, I guess the biggest thing is like people just setting a different, like you could be asking for a three, but there's, you know, set's going to be a different three than, you know, the other setter you have, and they might be setting more of a 31 and the other one, you know, so just different stuff like that. Right. How about you, Ava S? I mean, you've been to setter college a bunch, but uh, do you have any, you know, thoughts or comments on the yeah. subject? Ours are all pretty general, but we do do our school colors too. Okay. All right. So, and before we get in the conversation of lingo outside of sets, like my, my comment on it would be if you are coaching. So a lot of the people who join the seminar are coaches. If you're coaching, I would recommend you be pretty mindful of your level. I would try my best if I were coaching at the level one. So if I were coaching a frost off team, a two or threes team at the club level, if I was coaching in an area where volleyball is not very popular, I would do my best to keep the sets fairly generalized to things like four, five, one, pipe, things that if these kids are ever to travel or like try out for different teams or to go to a camp somewhere, they're going to fit in pretty well with understanding the lingo. But if you happen to be coaching a team that is either A, already at a pretty decent level or B, is you feel is on the cusp of having the ability to be at a decent level, I definitely recommend trying to develop your own system if you feel like it's a team who you're going to have longevity with. If it's like, hey, I'm going to get these kids in for three months and we're going to hit it hard and then they go off elsewhere, keep things simple. Like, to me, you don't want to spend half of your practices trying to teach rotations, trying to teach lingo, trying to teach, like, systems that way. But, like, for myself – who generally, if I play on a team or coach a team, I'm going to take them for numerous years. We will make our system as simple as possible at first, and then we just add lingo, we add types, we add sets, but we always go revert back to what is simplest, what are the things that we can rely on, what are, what are the simplest sets that we know if we got in a really rough situation, this will score for us, or we will have setter middle connection with this setter outside hitter connection. My issue has always been with, especially teams who I've played against, uh, done consultations for, done camps for, where they try to run these really intricate offenses. And it's all for naught because it works out well when they're playing against a team who is not great defensively. But all of a sudden when they're playing against a, a pretty disciplined team or they're playing against an organized team, their system completely breaks down because all of a sudden the service pressure is tougher. They're not able to pass the ball the same way. Hitters are confused. Setters are like setting inside balls while the hitter's outside and they're popping over free balls and they're giving away their opportunity to even have a chance to win. So my order of operations with, with set routes would be always, always have three sets that you know you can rely on. And maybe for some systems, that's like, look, we have one girl who's our stud and we need to set her everywhere. So what three sets, like, are we setting that girl? Because when push comes to shove, that's our ace. That's who we're going to. Like when I came up in Las Vegas, that was often the situation. There was a girl named Haley Spellman who played there and ended up going to Stanford, like a 6'4 left-handed girl. And literally Durango's offense was – Nine out of 10 sets are going to go to Haley if we're playing a quarterfinal, a semifinal, a final, and we're going to set her on the left, we're going to set her on the right, we're going to set her out of the back row, we're going to set her quick tempo. If there's like a blocker who's, you know, can match up to her, all the way up to, you know, now I, I work with teams who are competing to be like the best team in the country, trying to like win gold medals in the open division. And for them, it's like, this is like every player on our team could run whatever, but setting Alex a go ball on the left, his line shot is just really hard to stop. Setting Justin like a front one on a good pass, he, that's almost automatic for us. And setting this guy the pipe attack when we're jammed up, he just does this with the ball. So sometimes it's personnel based and sometimes it's situationally based, like what rotation you're in. Uh, but more often than not, I, I would like to have a team system, make it team-based. Like, this team does well in these situations. Like, oh, we, we have a setter who can just run the heck out of the slide. So we want to be really good at our slide or our left side set. This setter really struggles to set the slide, so we want to keep the, set, the middle in front of her. We'll practice the slide in practice, 
But ultimately, we want to keep our middles in front where the setter can see them. There's less misconnects. Like things like that to me are the difference between 25, 23. Like, it, yeah, you have to serve, you have to pass, you have to have a certain ability, you know, but when things are close, like the, the levels of the teams are close, to me, it's all system. It's like, what things make the athletes feel confident? Like, are they confident when we get to 23 all, we've run this set a bunch of times, we know where to go with it, or are they like, shoot, coach said on the free ball, we have to run the inside route, but we didn't really practice it. And it's a free ball, should I run it? And the setter's thinking the same thing. And then now we're free balling over, the other team's like hammering it, and like our confidence is gone. I see that like more than you can imagine. I take advantage of that, you know, as a coach, when I see that from an opponent, I'm like, when I start to see that look like in the outside hitter's eyes and they're like looking at the setter, I go, oh yeah. I tell my team, I say, this is what we're looking for. This is what's coming right now. So my, my biggest advice, uh, lingo honestly doesn't matter too much. If you have a team who you're spending time with and you know there's gonna be some sort of longevity, trying to make sure that they understand one, two, three things. This is where our bread and butter is. This is like what we rely on when things get challenging or they're easy. This is what we start matches with to get in a groove. Like that to me is where the most successful teams are born from the Olympic level down to like the freshman level in high school. That's, that's where I've found the most consistency. All right, so based on that, we're gonna add in our guy, Sean here. Sean, let, it, let me know when you can hear us. You there, Sean? Yeah, hey. Hey, hey. All right, so whatever you miss, you can just pick up. We'll be posting the video uh, afterwards. We'll put it on YouTube. So everybody, if you guys didn't know that, uh, we're videoing this as well. So we'll put the link on YouTube and then put it in a, in a link that's just available for you guys to see if you want to go back and look at any of the concepts or whatever the case. So, um, Sean, we were just getting into lingo and we were talking a little bit about uh, when lingo should potentially switch and or if there's times where it's important to have a certain kind of lingo versus another and the spark notes of it are to me it's not super important what your lingo is as long as everybody on the team has a, a very clear understanding of what the system is right. and has three confident things you know that they can rely on if things are challenging or not mm -hmm. all right so based on that everybody uh, do you guys have any questions comments concerns on that conversation lingo all right, so today I wanted to get into uh, rotation one and rotation two and realizing uh, technically you can set up your rotation however you want. It's kind of the beauty of volleyball, but I'll just talk about a generic rotation. So I want you guys to write this down. Um, you can list it on your paper. So write setter and then right next to it, write area one. So when I'm talking about uh, rotation one, I will refer to the setter starting in rotation one, and then rotation two, the setter being in area six, rotation three, the setter being in area five, rotation four, setters in fourth, rotation three, setters in three, or excuse me, rotation five, setters in three, rotation six, setters in two. So if there's anybody on the call who doesn't know the areas in volleyball, American areas, um, that right back spot, where a setter would normally serve from. Just imagine that spot and then go in a horseshoe. So moving down and forward towards the net, that'd be area two. Middle front would be area three. Left front, if you're looking at the net, would be area four. Left back, if you're looking at the net, would be area five. And then middle back would be area six. So anytime I'm referring to the areas, which I'll do frequently rather than like pointing, uh, that's what I'm referring to. So one and then a horseshoe over to six that way. So in rotation one, um, depending on the men's game, women's game, personnel, lack of personnel, a big question that I always get is why would I choose to have a person pass versus not pass? Why would I choose to play somebody in the back row versus have a DS for them? Where is that line of this person is a really dominant and active hitter versus their serve receiver defense isn't isn't up to par and you know i'm kind of trying to i want them to be up to par but i don't want to lose matches in the meantime like is there anybody on the call who who has questions about that 
situation? Yeah. Um, so like I play, so this is like my first year of like really getting into volleyball. And like, so when I play with teams, sometimes I feel like I'm the only one that really wants to like get better and learn and like do stuff like this. And so like, what do you do when like, you know, you have, like, you don't want to lose matches and you know, like you said, you got players that are really good at, you know, defense and maybe they can't play offense or like you mentioned, they're a good hitter, but they can't pass. Like, what's your, I mean, do you have a better way of like trying to, cause sometimes like, you know, then you get people that are frustrated because, you know, they want to pass, but they're not good. And then you're starting to take their balls or you're moving them. Like, you know, like, how do you handle that? Yeah, that's a good question. Are you, are you coming from the coach's perspective or the player's perspective? Uh, player's perspective. Okay. Yeah. That's a really good question. So honestly, the answer is the same, whether you're coach or player, but uh, I was just curious your situation. So that is a, that is a question I, we get fairly frequently. Like, okay, I'm a player. I'm really wanting to like raise my level with the people around me don't care essentially, except for their playing time. Like they don't care to take the steps to get better, but they want to play uh, and be on the court or else they'll complain. So my advice in that situation is if you're an athlete and you feel like you have a coach who has any level of care, I would start to develop a relationship with the coach and it's not on a coach's pet type situation. That's like, like, this is like an important concept in life to me. If you're playing sports, if you're in business, if you're in relationships, like you really want to learn to avoid caring what other people think about what you do. Like if you're a, a hard worker and you're like, I really want to get good at volleyball and people are like, dude, you take the game too seriously. Like you, you need to learn how to chill. Like ignore that, that ideology. If you have people around you who are less than dedicated, that doesn't have to mean ever you have to, to come down to their level. A lot of people, they, they go with that solution. They say, well, you know, my team's not so dedicated, so maybe I should relate to them more. Maybe I should be a little bit more like them and then I could affect them. And I, I would never, I would never give you the advice of choosing that direction. Like for me, you always go to your extreme and you avoid caring if, if anybody around you feels the same, wants the same, desires the same, appreciates the same, because eventually if you continue to work hard, you continue to put in the time, you continue to be ingratiated. My belief is that you can find a situation with peers. Um, even if it's on Zoom calls like this, where there's a lot of people who are clearly wanting to learn because this is something that's optional in their life, they're not forced into doing, or you get seen by somebody. Like I, I personally have gone through no less than six seasons in my life where I have watched an athlete on a team, whether it was at JOs or a tournament or a practice or at an open gym, and I've watched them and I go, that person has way more dedication to the game than the people around them. And then the next question I ask is, is there something I could do to change their circumstance? So I'll give you an example real quick. There's this kid named Alejandro Alvaran. And in like 20, this must have been 2012. In like 2012, he was playing at JOs in the club division. For, so for those of you who have ever coached club or are in the women's game, the men's version of club is like the women's fourth division. So like open, American, USA, Patriot, whatever it is these days, like club for men's is like the last division in women's. So it's like not a high level. And this kid is like 6'3", pretty raw, like, but I, you can just see it. You can see it in his movement. You see in the way he was like trying to get his guys going. He like really wanted to be good. And his team clearly was uninterested in working hard, his team was clearly making the decision before the match if they were going to win or if they were going to lose, if it was worth their time. Like, I, I could watch him for three minutes and see that these guys were treating this as a vacation rather than, you know, a competitive experience. And so I literally, after his match, walked over to him. I said, hey, my name's Chris. Um, I watched you play. I think that you could be really good. Do you live in California? And he said, yeah, I live in California. And I said, okay, I don't know what your situation is, and it doesn't really matter, but I know that currently you're playing 16s. And I have a group that I'm going to be working with uh, and you fit the age division. If you're interested in playing at the division one level, you know, I have an experience that you could get into. And he could have totally been like, Hey dude, you're weird. You know, walk away. He could have been like, Oh, I'm, I'm already set up over here. And he was like, I'd love to hear about it. Here's my phone number. And I called him, I brought him to two open gyms 
And then long story short, this kid ended up coming from a pretty rough neighborhood. Like mom was, was an addict. Dad was nowhere to be found. He was kind of on his own. He lived behind Dodger stadium, which was like 60 miles away from our practice location. And this kid went from like barely being able to attend school because he didn't have a ride to a school that was eight miles away to playing division one volleyball on a scholarship because he was working and he was like doing his thing in a five minute period. And I happened to notice it. So I can't even imagine looking back how many frustrated practices he had, how many days he was like, should I just quit? How many days he was like, is this worth my time? Or had people telling him that it's not cool to work hard or whatever stuff people hear. But all it took was like five minutes of me walking by and seeing it and his life changed. So I'm not saying that that situation is going to happen for everybody, but what I do know is there's only one way to give yourself the opportunity for it to happen. And that's to every day, like go about your process as if nobody else's, nobody else's input, you know, really matters. And then if you're able to master that, then you're hoping to be able to have influence on the people around you. But in honesty, influence is really something that people have to decide on for themselves. Like I get the question pretty often, like, I'm a person or a coach or a player who I work really hard at what I do. Like a lot of coaches contact me and they say, Chris, I really want my team to be good. And we come from an area where volleyball is not popular and I give them opportunities and free open gyms and I use my time and they just kind of like, they're flaky. They don't show up. They, they ditch for other stuff. They say they're sick. They say they don't have money. And I tell everybody the same way, like you're not going to have the opportunity to change people until you change yourself. Like, People have to watch you and they have to be influenced by the way that you go about your business or the way you go about your process and something inside of them has to decide like, I would want that for myself because you, you, you really cannot convince people to change their way unless they've watched you for some period of time. For some people it's five minutes, some people it's five years, but if they've watched you like, do something so repetitively and they start to become envious of that. They start to become envious of like your work ethic or the things you gained. Like, because I'll tell you that kid, Alex Alvaran, he's called me many times since then and told me, Hey Chris, like you remember those same kids from high school who didn't want to, you know, work hard or didn't want to play or like said that I was a, a doofus for, for, you know, caring so much. Those are the same guys now who call me, and ask me to hang out or call me and ask to spend time or call me and ask if I want to play, like play pickup volleyball. So for some people, they never figure it out. But if you're, a, if you're an athlete and you're in the situation where the people around you aren't as motivated before you even think about potentially being able to motivate them, I would make my mind, if I were you like a steel fortress and impenetrable to anybody trying to take away your motivation. Cause it's easy to get sucked into like the majority rules type thing. Like I'm working hard, I'm grinding, but these other 10 people don't care. So I'm just going to like lower my level of care. Like for me, I would rather like train myself to completely ignore and lose care for their opinions about what I'm doing. And I would turn it up a notch for me and try to see if I could get myself into a better situation or a better team or build a better relationship or anything like that. Does that help? Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's good stuff. Sweet. Anybody else have anything on a situation like that? All good? Okay, sweet. I was gonna say something kind of a little bit more simple too. It's really simple, but control what you can control. And at that point, like if you can't control your teammates or what's going on around you, like just compete and level up yourself. So like focus on what you want to focus on in practice, make sure you're transparent with your coach and getting feedback so that you can work on those things and just control what you bring to the table and the things that you want out of those practices. Uh, I've totally been in your shoes before. So um, that's what helped me. Okay. So we're going to shift the camera angle and we're going to give you guys a view of the court. All right, so we'll have some props. 
Oh, out here. And then you can just put that camera right behind. So can everybody see this okay? Right yep. here where your finger is, this is like the left side. And then this is the right side over here. Okay, so we're gonna put out some props. So you guys write this down because we're gonna keep this pretty consistent in the upcoming uh, webinars. Uh, so I want you guys to write down that blue cones are outside hitters. So like write that big, you're gonna wanna know that for like the next X amount of weeks. You know, as we continue to do these each month, you're gonna wanna know that. So like write it big, blue cones equal outside hitters. And there's two outside hitters for anybody who doesn't know. Generically, I guess you could technically have as many as you want or as few. <laughs> so the next thing will be the BOSU balls. Uh, if you don't know what a BOSU ball is, it's like the half ball with the blue bottom for balance. Those will be middles, middle blockers, middle hitters, middle players, whatever your lingo is. Those will be middles. And then the red pad, I'm going in a funky order here. Never mind that. Don't write red pad or scratch it out. That'll be the next thing. The, the orange cones, that will be right sides and setters. So right setters slash right side. And the reason that we're not individualizing those is sometimes we'll talk about 5-1 offense, which is where there's one setter. Sometimes we'll talk about 6-2 offense, which is when there's two setters with opposites. And sometimes we'll talk about the 4-2 offense, which is uh, not recommended, unless you're actually Clark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so the last thing is red pad will be the libero because um, not everybody's going to always use a libero. So that's something we can talk about if you guys have questions. Like, why would I choose to use a libero versus not? And what are the libero rules? That's like a question we get often. Like, what are the actual rules? Because, like, you can have two and you can't have two. And, yeah. So, okay. So all these things are out on the court. This is rotation one set up. So you guys should be able to see, bam. All right, so that orange cone right there with the ball on top of it, that's the setter. So anytime you guys see the orange cone that has the ball, that's the setter. The other orange cone, can't reach over there. That one is the, is the opposite for right now, the, the right side, the front row right side. All right, so in this, this is a generic rotation. This would be with outside hitters passing. So the blue cones are the outside hitters. And then the orange cone that's up near the net, that would be the opposite or right side. In some systems, people have their right side pass. Why would I have my right side pass? Because they're a good passer. Uh, the outside hitter who's over there near the cone, Two reasons that you would have them pass or not pass. The reason you have them, anybody pass is because they're good at passing um, or they're developing. But if you were to push up your outside hitter like Coach Ashley is doing right now, the reason I would do that is, A, if I have a really slow setter, like if my setter struggles to get from like 20 feet off the net to the net by the time a ball's passed, I would start them up there closer to the net. Or if I want to isolate that hitter's job, like, I've had teams where that passer is bomb, but like they're a person we just have to set. So I don't want them like having to hit the ground or like dive, like we need to set them. So I'm not gonna have them pass in that rotation. And that would be a reason. So this is a different look at rotation one that way. Um, is there anybody on the call who like doesn't know rotations very well and needs any kind of instruction on rotations or why or what, anything like that? Okay. So, what questions do you guys have, if any, uh, on rotation one? I think my question would just be, do you prefer a three-person defense for passing or four-person? Good question. So, that's a really good question. So, for me, I would always judge the amount of passers on three things. Um, and there would be three options for me. There are systems where I'll have three people pass most frequently. Sometimes I'll have four. Sometimes I'll have two. Um, and so why I would choose to have four is if I'm facing, usually in the men's game, honestly, but if I'm facing a server who's just got so much velocity or so much range, and when you guys hear me use the word range, I'm referring to how they can spread things out. So hitting range, 
spread things out. Defensive range, how they can spread things out. I'm referring to how things, uh, things can be spread out. So I would choose four passers if a server had so much velocity that it takes my passers, like my passers don't really get more than one step to the ball. I want to cover as much court as possible. Or if the range of a server is just so dynamic where they can go short, deep, sideline, seam, like where my passers kind of same thing. They're just like, ah, oh, like they'd have to move so far. To me, having four passers shrinks the court for a server. Like it does not give them as much open space visually. But the issue with four passers uh, could potentially be that one, it's funky rotationally for some people. Like some setters get like, whoa, that looks weird to me kind of thing. Um, and then it also, to me, what I've noticed in four person passing, it takes away dominance. So. To me, at a really high level, you should start to get into more granular things beyond I'm just looking at our hitting percentages and looking at like who, what area we're serving. I start to think about things like, do I have a player who plays better when they pass before they hit versus not passing before they hit? Do I have an athlete who plays better when they touch the ball frequently? Like in basketball, you hear about like people who have the ball stick with them or like Russell Westbrook needs to have the ball in his hands or Kevin Durant doesn't need to have the ball in his hands. You hear conversations like this, but I very infrequently hear them utilized in volleyball, but it's all the same. Like I totally have players where I've looked at their sample size, I test and statistically, and they're like astronomically better when they're in the passing rotation versus when I have them like standing up in the corner. Uh, and vice versa, I have people whose numbers go way down when you add responsibility. Like they don't even have to touch the ball, but the fact that they have to think about touching the ball makes them like undynamic all of a sudden. So one, I would recommend you train that into your athletes, coaches, and or into yourself players, like being dynamic. But it's something that not a lot of people think about, like starting to ask those questions. What benefits the team the most uh, should be the question, especially when you're playing matches. Where for me in training, my question is often for my first half, what benefits the individuals the most? So I try to train, not try, I do successfully train complete athletes. Like the athletes who play on my teams, they can do anything, like literally anything. They can hit quicks, they can hit high balls, they can hit pins, they can set offenses, they can pass, they can dig, they can serve, they can cover, like their IQ is there. But it, it, there's a sacrifice in that. You know, my teams don't play very much six on six. Like there's not a lot of live play and practices. So I communicate with them frequently about the importance of them getting competitive environments. Like, hey, when you're away from practice, I want you to play in basketball leagues. I want you to go find a soccer league. I want you to play backyard barbecue with your family because we're not going to be doing all competitive things, especially for the first part of a training block. More often than not, we're going to be training your skills and we're going to be training situational things and we're gonna be training your mentality. And my belief, which is shown uh, over the years, is if you train those three things, so if you train technique, if you train mentality and you train IQ, you can win. You don't, you don't have to have like a 12 person roster and play six on six. You don't have to have like giant people. You don't have to have big arms. Like you can win, you can win matches. Now, winning the national championship requires some physical physicality but winning matches you just need to have those three things you need to have technique to the point where any serve you face you feel like you could pass any set you know that's setter that's in front of you you can read block you know any ball you set you know you have some attacking options and then beyond that it's it's really about building the iq so in rotation one a lot of people get stuck why do you guys think like based on the, the original diagram we gave you why do you guys imagine a lot of people get stuck in rotation one just the oh the outsides are usually more comfortable can you hear me yeah the outsides are usually more comfortable hitting on the left okay um, anybody else my lower level they're not as dynamic um i would agree with that and i'd also say like maybe your outside is not your better passer okay so the first one by Sean was, 
Uh, outside hitters may be less comfortable hitting on the right. They're, they have comfort hitting on the left. What was yours, uh, Sammy? Uh, that they might not be good at that good at passing. In service okay, two. so serve receive issues in rotation one. Anybody else? The transition game in um, one is also weird for my teams. Like just that opposite and the outside switching. Um, Lower levels, they, that's it gets easier with age, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So having a switch potentially, if that's a system you run, all good things. So what I have found, and I remember this started to get high, highlighted or highlit, highlighted to me in college. Um, my coach, John Sparoff, uh, he was my coach my junior year at UC Irvine. He's now the head coach of the men's national team. And I very distinctly remember, this was my first time playing at a really high level. Like I had ironically coached at a really high level, but I hadn't played yet at a really high level. Um, my coaching career preceded my, my playing career. And we used to spend two days every week, like practicing five days a week. We used to spend two days training literally the whole practice, rotation one. And like, it did not make sense to me at the time. I was like, Percentage wise, it doesn't make sense. There's six rotations. We're spending two of five days practicing one rotation. The other days we're not being specific about a singular rotation. Like, why do we always practice rotation one? And this is when I started to get more into the analytics of volleyball. Well, to this day, I'm still more of an eye test guy. I I'm way if you ask me, like I had to choose, like eye test versus analytics, I test all day long. But having a little bit of uh, savvy with both I started to get into the analytics and I was like man if you look at teams there was this uh there was this program called data volley when I was in college and you start to look at teams percentages in rotation one and they would literally be like they side out 62 percent in row three they side out 67 percent in row four they side out 21 percent in row one and you'd be what in the world like so I started to research this and like talk to Sparaw and he was like, oh yeah, that's like a thing up to the Olympic level. Like teams in rotation one, it's opposite for a lot of people. And a lot of people aren't trained in a way where they're so dynamic. You know, people's best players are, their best player can hit on the left, on the right, out of the back row. But the rest of the, the pieces are very comfortable with things being one way. So that's accurate. You know, what you had said, Sean, about there being discomfort with people on opposite side. That's totally mentally funky for people or people potentially having to switch if you have like a left hander and a right hander who don't you know train both sides or uh serve receive issues because somebody is spending full practices passing and hitting on the left side and then in a match they're passing on the right side like sammy said those are all real things so for you all as coaches and players uh something to be very aware of at any level is where are your team's deficiencies that's a really important question. And maybe you are fortunate and you have a team who's just got a really good setter and a really good outside and row one's no problem for you. Because as long as the ball's in the air, your setter chucks into your outside and they smash it cross court and row one's done. But maybe like most people, all of a sudden when your setter's in the front row, they, they can't dump effectively. Or now you only have two hitters because you have no back row attack and teams get you stuck. Or maybe when you have a back row setter, they're slower and they don't get their hands on the ball. Now you're bump setting all the time and now you're not dynamic. These are things that like people honestly don't think about very often. So I want to make sure that it is a thought, whether you've thought about it or not in you all's heads when you're coaching, when you're playing. What deficiencies do we potentially have? But then equally as important as understanding what areas you are proficient at, what areas you are successful. You know, like what things can you lean on? And in my observation over time, watch, having watched a lot of practices, being, being a part of a lot of practices and tournaments, I find that people don't practice the things they're good at often enough to, to keep them good. Like if you're very good at your, your left side go ball sides out very well, or your libero is great at passing in area six, you know, getting you three passes or getting you perfect passes, people often go, well, that's already taken care of, so we're good. And then they get in like big tournaments, AKA tournaments with like some kind of status or, or ranking on the line. And they find that those areas fall apart because they weren't trained. 
or even brought to the attention of an individual like, hey, you're solid for us. When you're in rotation six, keep doing what you're doing. Like if you can add confidence to your athletes and like, oh, this is something I do well. Yeah, I'm going to make that my identity. That's what I'm going to lean on. Like all of us, I'm sure who've coached for long enough have like the hustle player, right? Who they just, they're the example of like, hustling in practice and going after the ball and the team celebrates them when they hustle. You'd be surprised, even if that player sucks, you'd be surprised how often you throw that person in, in an even game where you just can't seem to get like a defensive stop or you sub them in for like one of your more average servers, even if their serve is terrible. And they are just like a spark plug. Like they go in and serve some loopy, ugly serve, but go in and like, call out what's happening with the hitter and pop a ball up and the team's stoked and you set your best player on the left and they smash it. And now like your run has begun. So don't get too stuck, you know, as a coach or as a player in routine. However, understand very clearly what things make you successful and lean on them. Like understanding the characteristics of your team, understanding the identities, like, what things make your team gain confidence? What things make them lose confidence? Understand that first so you can win matches immediately and then begin to work out the things that you're deficient in that way. Those are like big mistakes I see from players and coaches. Like, I'm just going to spend time working on the things that I'm not good at. Okay, well, in the meantime, you're also getting worse at the things you're already good at because you're not training them or keeping them fresh. Like, it's the same way in a gym. If you go to the gym – and you have naturally strong biceps and you're like, oh, I need to work on my quads and my triceps. While you're spending time working on the things you're not good at, you're gonna lose bicep strength and then all your balance is gonna be off. So do we have any like questions, comments, concerns on that concept? Yeah, can I just ask about uh, rotation one? So like, I actually have a lot of personal experience. I had a tournament this summer and we lost our playoff round because we won the first match and then we lost the last two and we went down, I think it was 10 to two, both games. And, you know, so you're in that first rotation, like what do you recommend from like a, and this was like a six team, a six person team. We didn't have any subs or anything. Like what do you do to switch stuff up? So you don't, cause we literally lost those games, even though we were the better team, just because we couldn't get out of that rotation. Good question. So here would be my order of operations on that answer. One, I would start, one rotation forward from whatever your worst rotation is. So if you're like row one, we just are like a train wreck. I would start in rotation two every match, like I, every match. Like I would take that our last. Like we are not running into that for six points minimum. That is like one thing I would absolutely do. I don't care if my best server was in row one. If like my team cannot slide out in rotation one, we're starting in row two. That's it. Um, the second thing would be start to see if you can have a quote unquote automatic. So if you're, if you have a setter, like a lot of us do, you have a setter who's like, Oh, I'm always going to come into every match trying to be the hero. Cause my mom told me I need to get video for college and they need to see I'm a dynamic setter. I would walk right up to my setter and I would say, if you don't set person a every ball in rotation one, I will pull you from the match. Like straight like that. And that's an example of like a threatening jokey way, you know, but I, I would, I would approach my team. I would be honest with the team and I would say, look, rotation one for us is, is a nemesis right now. So our best chance of getting out of row one is setting Ashley every time. Don't get fancy setter with the perfect pass and think, Oh, I'm going to set the quick this time or I'm going to every single ball goes to Ashley until we side out. And I'll tell you guys, this is not just at a lower level. I was in the national championship in 2012 at USC, playing USC. In the first set, we edged them out. We beat them uh, barely. In the second set, we were down 15 to 8. One of their players makes a boneheaded play. Like, we hit the ball out of bounds, but he, it's like six feet out, and he plays it. And we end up winning the point and coming back and beating them 25-22. Our opposite is going off. And in the third set, we're up by three points. The score is 15 to 12. And me, who's in my first year of like playing division one, starting matches, setting at a high level, like I'm having all these firsts all like in a three-month period. I'm in the national championship. 
and I'm thinking this, like, oh, I'm gonna be the MVP. I'm gonna like show my dynamicness. I'm gonna like kill them all. And we're up 15, 12. And so like perfect pass. I should have probably been setting our opposite, but I'm learning in real time. And I set the ball to our BIC, like our offense all year long. I'm like riding the BIC. Our BIC is hitting like over 500. And our French outside hitter, Kevin Tilly, maybe some of you know him. Uh, he plays on the French national team. He was, and his dad's the head coach. He was uh, my teammate. So I set him the BIC. He steps on the line, crushes the BIC, but steps on the line by like that much. Back row attack, point USC. 13-15. Very next play. Serve. Ball is like three more feet off the net, but still a pretty good pass. And I try to set like a side, fancy, quick set. And our middle completely can't reach it. Like he whiffs it. And like the ball hits the net and goes down on our side. 14-15. I'm, I'm like confident. So I'm not looking at the coach. I'm not. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to take care of it. It's all good. So like next ball gets served. It's past 11 feet off the net. I set our left side outside hitter, Connor Hughes. He gets stuff blocked straight down. USC like starts doing laps on their side of the court. It's 15 off. Bra calls the timeout. Like at the time, I'm not – even though when I'm coaching, I am very aware of these things, but I'm in real time as a player. I'm not considering all the little granular things. All I'm thinking is like, who should I set the side out? And Sprawl calls a timeout. He literally ignores the rest of the team. He walks over to me and grabs me on my jersey. And he says, you set Carson until we get on the bus. Like verbatim, <laughs> verbatim. And Carson is our opposite. And all year long, Carson and I had not had a connection. It was actually like the point of conversation all year. Um, like Carson, who was backing up Clay Stanley on the national team as the opposite, I could, I just could not connect with him. Like he was literally hitting 0.062 off of me. And he's like backing up the national team opposite, but in college, he's hitting like worse than your bench player off of me. So I have a little bit of a mental block with like the back set. So I'm like, I'm going to set the big and I'm going to set the quick and I'm going to set the left side. And that's my offense. And so Sprawl is like, you set Carson until we get on the bus. And so I go, all right, like he said it kind of thing. And I don't, I don't have much confidence in, in my back set, but I'm like, whatever, I'm just going to let it rip. So we go on to me literally setting him the next 21 out of 22 balls. I set him 21 out of 22 balls. And the only time I did the set him was when I was like 20 feet off the net and I had to like chuck up a left side set. And so we end up winning the match and Carson had a great match. Like he was killing it like boom, boom, boom. So my point of this story is sometimes it's not about like being dynamic and having options and at any level, at the freshman level, at the national team level, sometimes you just got to go to your guy. Like you go to your person. And so I would remind my team of that frequently. Like, and I wouldn't be shy about it. I wouldn't care if, people get their feelings hurt. I would say, listen, like if we are in rotation one and you as a coach know rotation one is challenging, we're setting Lexi every ball. I don't, I don't care if we don't slide out six times in a row, if we slide out on the first ball, like you're setting Lexi every ball because that is the number one shot we have. And Lexi on time number six is higher percentage than Kelly on time number one. Like that's just the reality sometimes. And if your team gets their, if your team gets their feelings hurt, you live with that, but they need to live in reality. And so that's a lesson. I'm fortunate I did not have to learn the hard way by being fancy and setting other people, going to a fourth set with USC and USC's place, having them get some momentum, maybe going to five sets, and then who knows? Like for me, I was fortunate to learn that lesson in real time. It worked out for me, uh, but for a lot of people, it does not work out. And so for me now, that is, a, that is one of the first things I talk with my teams about. I say, if we're in a challenging situation, this, these two plays are our go-to plays. If we could set this person, like if it's a middle, for example, we're going to set this middle on this route, and they are going to probably hit the ball here because that's their best swing. Block, no block. Team's best defender, doesn't matter. If we don't get that situation, here's plan B. And they know, so I don't even have to say it. Like My setters will look me in my eyes at 23 all, and I'll nod at them. And they're like, I know it's going to Kevin, it's going to Alex, it's going to Ashley, whatever. Like, it's not, it's not even a conversation later because we've talked about it. And we talk about it in front of the team so they know. There's none of this like, 
hey, I'm the hero. Come to the huddle and set me because they've been watching some Disney movie where some guy makes a heroic type of, no, like we're going to this person. Um, so everybody knows to go cover. Does that answer the question well enough? Yeah, I think so. Sweet. Anybody else? Thoughts, questions, comments, concerns on row one? Perfect. Okay. So what I want you guys to do, we're going to take uh, an intermission. Uh, we're going to come back at Lynn. Okay. So we're going to come. Yeah, it popped up and said you have unlimited time, so you don't actually have to start a new Zoom. Sweet. Okay. So this is what's going to happen. We're going to put this on mute. You guys are going to take a 10 minute intermission of you need to go to the bathroom or write down your questions or whatever. When we come back, I want you guys to have some questions for a Q&A. And then after the Q&A, we're going to put together a live demo on some concepts uh, that I go over with my teams and athletes and privates and all that sort of thing. Okay? So at 610, be ready to roll. 610, well, 610 Pacific. That's 10 minutes from now, wherever you are. <laughs> okay.
What up, what up? Is everybody here? <laughs> Check in. Ava, unmute. I'm here. Sammy, you in the house? Sean P? Where is Gabe? Gabe, you here? Yep, I'm here. In the house. All right. Okay, so uh, let's start with some Q&A. Um, rules of Q&A. No one can ask two questions in a row unless the rest of the group has no more questions. Um, all right, so go ahead. So what do you do like in a game, let's say you, um, let's say you lose five points right away and you wanna switch momentum. Like what's okay. some of the go-to things you go to do to be like, okay, we just need to switch something up. That's a really good question. So number one, I, I, for, I, I always, when I teach, like to give uh, what not to do as well, uh, because I think that people, that tends to resonate with them. of like, oh, shoot, I totally do that. So what I would not do is automatically go to, oh, I need to switch a player. Like, I've found that from playing professionally in Europe to freshman volleyball, that's people's first thing. Like, Let me look down the bench and, like, get somebody in there. And, like, that to me is, like, that shows – you're panicking as a coach. Like you don't really have trust in your system. That's more often like what it feels like. Me. So it's not to say there's not times to sub, of course, but to me, subbing should be fairly planned. Like if we're in this situation, this is the sub I would go to. I know that this person is good for this situation. I would like to get this person in the game around this period of time, but like subbing to see if you can like change up the momentum is just going to make your team panicky and usually the kid is like coming off the bench they're not ready like if it wasn't planned so to answer your question uh the things that i like to do if my team were to hope i i don't I mean, that doesn't happen very often in my teams but if back in the days when it did happen very frequently uh, the things i would like to go to are one i would like to communicate with my setter about simplicity so usually if our team is not um if our team loses five points in a row, for most people, I would say it happens for one of three reasons. Your team is getting aced off the court or like passing the ball almost backwards. Uh, two, your setter is doing like crazy stuff, like ball's not hittable, hitters like have no shot, you know, they're just popping in free balls or making errors. Or C, like a team is just on a gnarly blocking or digging spree. Like they're just scooping everything. So. If I end up in those three situations, uh, I revert back to the thing that we talked about before the break, which was going to my go-to and just setting the go-to over and over until we can get out of it. Because if they're my go-to, they'll find a way. And if my go-to can't find a way, we probably shouldn't be playing the team that we're playing is kind of my feel. So uh, those are that's the thing I would, I would go to immediately. And then beyond that, I actually like to consult my staff. So, uh, if I were to ever end up in a situation where I were stumped as a head coach, I think a lot of times that head coaches and assistant coaches can both feel, uh, I'll call it the phenomenon of feeling like a little bit of small man syndrome. So they're like, ah, well, I don't want to go to another person because then it makes me seem like uh, not fit for the job or it makes me seem like I can't do my own job. But to me, like the greatest leaders – consults their staff that's why you have a staff like they know you the best they understand where your potential weak points are if you have any they're very aware of the the team and the surroundings they probably know things you don't even know because athletes communicate with them in a way that they don't communicate with the head coach a lot of times so I consult the staff I go talk to them I'm like what do you see but for me it's really important to preface like something I do frequently as a coach is I preface I don't wait for the problem to happen like I tell my staff in advance like Hey, if there's things you guys see, like communicate them. I don't, I don't make my staff wait for me to come to them and say, is there anything you guys see? Like I consistently I'm asking like the people who work with me, like you got anything, like even on the break, we were just on the break. And one of the first things I asked is like, Lynn, like, do you have any feedback? Coach Ashley, do you have any feedback? Like, I don't, I don't wait for something to go wrong. So I would put that into my game if I were you as a player as a coach like I would start prefacing I would start to see if I could be a little bit ahead of the game because the best coaches in every sport um, I'm going to name fairly men's sports here for a second but Bill Belichick Bill Jackson John Wooden people like that right like they're really good at prefacing but people on the women's side Pat Summit, 
Um, gosh, there's just people who are really good at prefacing the way I was thinking about females. Coach Lynn, thank you. So, um, yeah, that would be my answer to that. I would one, try to make sure that I go to my person, like don't make the mistake that I almost made in the national championship. Go to your guy, go to your girl. And then two, uh, consult your staff. If your staff is absolutely stumped and, or you don't have a staff for some reason, then I, I really would, I really would stick with, uh, go to your person. And if your team is just not passing, you need to get back in the practice gym and work on passing. Sometimes there's not a whole lot you can do. Like there is a reality. I would never, ever tell you to give up, but sometimes like you're outmatched and you need to use that as an opportunity to sit back and learn and go, why are we outmatched? Like, what do we need to spend time on? Like you need to watch like, Oh, our team clearly falls apart. If they lose three points in a row, they can't recover. There's no fight in them. We need to start having conversations about our mentality. Oh, our team like is pretty bad at passing the ball when it's served to area one. Like we spend some time on area one passing and like communicate about it. Like something I'm always doing when I'm coaching is I'm in my team's ear during the match, after the match, before the match, we're winning by a landslide, close matches, we're down, I'm in their ear. Like, these are the things we're doing really well. We need to keep this up. These are the things that we are not doing well and you guys need to pick it up on. Like, I don't care if we're beating a team 25-6. Like, if our transition, like, timing sucks and we're, like, tipping the ball for kills and the other team just so, like, can't play defense, like, I'm on them. Like, insert, in our next warm-up, we're doing transition. Like that's going to be our warm up, or we did not pass the ball very well with our platform and our next warm up, it's all platform like for the first minute and a half or whatever. Like we're on it all the time. We try to preface. So prefacing is my biggest piece of advice there. Does that help Gabe? Yeah. Sweet. That's great. Any other questions? Guys and gals. Um, I have a question. So okay. when it comes to like coaching on the sideline and stuff, are you more of someone who would like sit down or stand to coach? Cause I've heard like some people say they want to sit down because it's like extra pressure on the team that's playing. Like they don't feel like coach believes that they can do something. And then the other side of that is like, um, I've heard players say like, they don't think that their coach cares if they're not standing. So what's your like viewpoint on that? That's a really good question. I'm going to answer that in a couple ways. One, generically speaking and if you guys ever hear me say generic i'm saying like as if there were no variables which in sports there's always variables so generically speaking i prefer at the youth level a coach who stands um because it shows presence i do think regardless of how much you talk to youth about being solid in their own mind or believing in themselves they're going to look to you as a coach like especially when things are tough like they're going to look to you and they want to know that there's a presence there and it is challenging when they look over and they see somebody sitting, whether they're like elated or dejected, it, it seems like, oh, you've given up. That's like what a, what a kid thinks generically. On the pro side, I would prefer a coach or on the pro or like high level side, I would prefer a coach who sits and stands up situationally because to me, it's very important at that level to be pushing people to start to become self-sufficient even more than winning games. Like to me, I think it's huge to start to build strong young women, strong young men who are self-sufficient, can solve problem solve, and are not looking over their shoulder to see what boss thinks sort of thing. So that would be my generic answer. Um, but then to go a little bit more granular, I would say that you just don't want to be situational. Like you need to be consistent. So what I don't like seeing is like, when it's a big match, the coach is standing up. And when it's the first day of the qualifier, like the coach is sitting, like chit chatting with the assistant, they take stats in big matches, but they don't take stat. Like kids can sniff that stuff out from a mile away. So you need to be consistent. Like if you're going to stand, you stand the whole tournament. If you're going to sit, you sit the whole tournament, unless there's a reason to stand up. But what I really dislike is when I encounter teams where the coaches sits and they sit and then they're playing against like the number one seed and the game's tied and they're like, all of a sudden they're into it. It's like, that to me is just a joke. So I would try to be consistent and I would have reasoning for whatever you choose. If you choose to stand because you're a coach who likes to communicate frequently, I think there's value, especially at the youth level in talking a lot. Like, yeah, I'm going to be on the sideline and I'm going to, I'm going to be in your ear and I'm going to say stuff and realizing that there's a little bit of a, a risk factor to that and that your teams can easily 
become distracted if you're that way. Like I've had seasons where I choose early in the season, I'm going to be in my team's ear a lot. I'm like talking after every play. Like, yes, that's how we want to set up. That's not how we transition. That's not the set choice you'd make. This is what you do. That's not what you do. And then as the season goes, I wean off and they need to fill. But I talk to them about this. I tell them like early, I'm going to be doing a lot of the talking and you guys are going to be listening. And as the season goes, I will make you very clear of when that changeover is happening, but you guys need to start to fill the silence and I will step back and only insert my voice when it's very necessary. So to me, that is the way I would choose. I would choose that early on, you're very communicative, you stand up, you're present, you let them know that you're there. But as the season goes on, perhaps you stay standing up if, if you're the type who likes to move and stand up, but you allow them to have more of the voice. You let the people on the bench communicate what things they see. And so they feel engaged in the game and they're ready to go in when it's time and they're not chit chatting on the sideline or you give them tasks. Like some of my teams, I'll have them do workout stuff, you know, like, okay, you guys need to do this amount of push-ups every five points. You guys need to do this amount of sit-ups. You guys need to do this amount of jumps. Like, cause they're not being active, you know, during the game, like the people on the court are. And I want them to be getting a workout and I want them to be ready to go in. Um, and sometimes it'll be, okay, you guys are going to call out every rotation, what the tendency is like from the bench, you guys are going to say it amongst yourselves and I need to hear it like, so that they're engaged to me, bench engagement is huge to have a very cohesive team. The people on the bench have to feel like they have a shot to get in. Like they have to feel that way. They have to feel like either my work ethic and practice is going to give me a shot or like my teams, for example, like I designed my team so that everybody can play. Like, I don't, I don't have like, Hey, this is my starting groove. And then my subs go in. Like the way my teams are designed is I can play like three of my studs with four of my average people or four of my studs with three of my average people. And they know how to fill for each other. And what I tell people all the time is like, your candy is getting on the court. It's not being set like 10 balls. So don't chase the cat. I'll tell them like, if you're, if you're getting on the court, be stoked. Don't like, oh, well, you wanted to be on the court and now you want to be set 10 times and now you want to be the guy who gets the ball in to get, like, don't chase the cat. Like, your argument was, I want playing time. So you're on the court. Like, be stoked. Like, move around, dig balls, communicate, but you're not the guy. You're not the girl. Like, those are the kind of conversations I'll have, you know, people start to go up that ladder of, well, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Or if the parent, you know, goes there. I don't really talk to parents, but back when I did, uh, that would be a conversation that we'd have. Um, did that answer the question well enough? Yeah. Like some options there, some situations there. Anybody else? I think you're on mute, Sean. All right. Um, for uh, I'm like mental cues when serve receiving. Uh, I used to, if I ever got, you know, um, like if I'm on a roll, I used to play the bear for our club, my club team. Um, like I always was relying on my coach. He was always in my ear, and so he would kind of tell me good cues and then um i i want to be good at doing that for my players too um or do you leave them alone uh, what are good like mental cues when server receiving to get that yeah, that's a really good question so uh again i'll you guys will hear me re this on repeat i preface like that's a big thing i do in practice i prepare my team for when things are going to go this way versus that way mm. hey jason like when you're playing well this is how you stay in rhythm. This is how you stay in your zone. When you're not having a great game, these are things you should go to. These are cues in practice that, I'm, that I see from you. Oh, you tend to stop finishing your passes. So if you start to see yourself, your ball stray left and right, focus on holding your pass until the ball peaks. Or make sure that you're seeing the ball into your platform. Make sure that your lead step is clean. Make sure that da 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 like, Against float serves, I want you to make sure that your arms are not connecting until your footwork's done. Like, I'm fortunate to be at a position in my career where I can be very specific with an individual and my mind works in a way where I can remember back to people's habits even when they first start. So I can reference, like I can always pull. But whether you have that sort of mind or a more simple working mind as it pertains to sports, I would recommend giving them the simplest information that is sustainable. So don't give them situational things like, hey, this server's serving short, you need to get on the ball. It's like, well, they might serve the next ball deep. Like that's not helpful. Like 
there needs to be something that is valuable regardless of what's coming at them. So mentally, I talk to them frequently about their responsibility. Your responsibility is to be the most confident. Like that's literally a responsibility you can give somebody. It doesn't have to do with touching the ball. I will talk to my liberos frequently about their responsibility being to look, feel, sound the most confident about our service eve. And that's something you're going to work at. Whether you feel confident in your platform or you don't, whether you like floats more than spins, whether you are playing the best outside hitter in the country or you're playing Joe Schmo team on day one, your job is to make sure that starting with you and then spreading to the others, when I look at you, there is a very clear sense of confidence. Like, because people feel it. Like, the people around you will feel it. So that, to me, is A1. Um, and then two, little technical things. So I like to break things down with liberos in three main areas. One, feet. So some people really struggle with feet. Like, they, they cross their feet over. One side is more balanced than the other. One foot likes to finish out in front. Like, so I, one, we work on it in practice, but I talk to them about their feet. If it's like a foot person where they need to have like, when your feet get on the ground, your percentages go what way up. When you get that lead step going the direction of the ball, your percentages go way up. When you knee drop on the short stuff versus try to stay on your feet or run through, your percentages go up. Like I give them information like that. The second thing for liberos would be visual. So I talk, to, I talk to them about their order of operations visually. I say, make sure you see the toss. Make sure you understand what type of serve it is. Make sure you remember the tendency. If we talked about it pre-match, like this jump server loves the slice from one to one. Like you need to be prepared for the ball to go on your right side. This short float guy or, or girl, they are real deceptive with the short serve. So make sure you're seeing their arm. Like if their arm slows down, you need to prepare for the short serve or whatever. And then the last thing is touch base. So I'll talk to them frequently. Holding the platform is like a big one for a lot of people, but shaping sometimes, like I want people to focus on their shoulders. Some people I want them to focus on their forearms. Some people I talk to them about their hand position. Some people it's gosh, making sure that their thumbs are even so that the ball comes in evenly and it's not uneven. Like any little details that make them feel confident. And sometimes it could totally be placebo. That's the reality of coaching. Like you could know this kid like passes the ball fine when you tell them that treat the ball like a balloon. And they're like, oh, okay, it's a game now. Like I've literally seen the most funky stuff work for people. So be experimental in practice. And then in matches, if you're playing matches that don't really change your seating, be experimental, you know, try people out. Like people get just too, mm, this is the box in volleyball. Like, and the coolest thing to me about right now, the national teams, if either you got, and if any of you guys follow the national teams is both coaches right now are very creative. Like Karch Karai right now is having previous outside hitters play libero rather than like, oh, we have to have like a college libero come in and play libero. He's like, None of you liberos are up to snuff. We'll put Megan Courtney at libero. She's like a 6'2 outside hitter from Penn State who led the team in kills. She's our libero because she can pass and dig and set. Like, or we're going to take three setters to the Olympics. And everybody else is like, you only get 12 people. Why would you take three setters? That's stupid. It's like being creative is the way to start getting to a new level. So I don't want any of you to feel like you're beyond being creative because you're not me or you're not John Sparrow, you're not whoever like creativity you know is the whole reason a lot of us got into this game as a player or as a coach so be creative uh, but those three areas I would say making sure that you give them whatever tools are necessary to feel as confident as possible uh, and then after that I would focus on feet are they a person who's good at their feet if not communicate that way are they a person that's good with uh, their tracking visually if not speak about that and then are they a person who's good with their touch and if they are not then speak about that if it's a multitude of things they need more training or put somebody else in the position hopefully that helps anybody else questions comments you got anything terry yeah i just have one um one more question okay, so good. and this is just uh this is just like from a player's perspective but like i notice for myself when i play when i practice it's like I literally don't care. I literally just play my heart out and I feel like I play my best. Sometimes like in game situations, uh -huh. I feel like 
like how do you get your confidence from your practice level to like in game like okay i'm zoning in like i know i can play that's a good question so this is gonna sound like duh but it's like <laughs> such a challenging concept for people you have to be able to treat them the same like it, it just man i had a girl in here two hours ago i was giving a lesson to and she actually is in competition on her club team with two other girls I train. So the two other girls who start over her are girls I train and they're like bigger, stronger, more experienced, everything. And this girl who does not work that hard yet, uh, <laughs> she believes she does. She, I'm, I'm, she's starting with me, so we're getting her in that motion, but she thinks she works hard. And she's like, I just, I wanna play so bad and I just don't understand because I get in practice and I like hype myself up before practice that I'm, I'm gonna play outside hitter. I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna go rock it. And then like I go try and I play bad. And it's in front of the coach and it's da, 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 da. And I talked to her about this concept, which when it's just a concept to a 12 year old girl, it's, it's a concept, it's not like a law. So I say, well, have you ever considered ignoring anybody's opinion about how you play? And she's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, do you care about your coach's opinion? She's like, well, yeah, that's the person who chooses if I play. And I go, actually, it's not the person who chooses who you play. Because there is such thing as being good enough to where there's no argument. There's, su there's such thing as being so good to where even if a coach literally dislikes you as a person, it's just too obvious to everybody around. Like, you can't not play that person. That's how a lot of people felt about Kobe Bryant, rest in peace, for a long time. Like, Kobe Bryant, oh, he just, like, shoots. But he's just such a ball haul. He saw this. He saw that. But, like, when he starts winning championships, you go, like, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? Like, the recipe works. So, people feel that way about Serena Williams. People feel that way about Karch, you know? Like, so, to answer the question directly, if I'm in that situation where I feel like, gosh, like in practice, I've just been killing it and I've been doing work and I've been consistent. And in the match, I'm just not, I, I can't seem to put it together. I would do my best to train mentally how I can start to make them symmetrical. How can I literally make the practice the same as the match? And in order to do that, you would have to do one of three things. Uh, one is you could read my book that's coming out on December 14th, Become Your Best. Uh, two, in seriousness, you could start to live your life that way. Like too often people try to separate. They try to make things, well, this is me and volley, this is me in life. Like they will intersect at the most inopportune times. Like they will intersect. So if you wanna be a person who shows up when the lights turn on, it has to be in every situation. Like if I'm playing pickup basketball in the facility, I'm training it. Like, oh, it's game time. I'm talking it, I'm doing it. Um, there's no like, oh, well, I suck at basketball. That's not my sport. There's no excuse. Like that's who I am. If I'm being a parent, if I'm hanging out with my friends, like I have to show my most confident side. I have to treat it like, oh, the lights are on. It's time to show, oh, you got the camera on? Let's go, now's the time. I'm not gonna shy away because those things are what, show, are what show up. Like the nervousness, the inconsistency, the lack of belief, the questioning, like that's what it is. Inherently, that's what it is. Consciously, subconsciously, when we get to those moments where we're like in practice, when it's loose, there's no consequence. I can just play free. I know these people, but let me put it on the court and now I can't put A plus B together. It's because we're treating it differently. We're treating it like, oh, this counts for something. Or, oh, this is what I've been training for. Like, if you just treat it like another day, I'm just training. I'm just getting better today. I'm just, it's just another day of volley. But like legit, not just like speaking about it. Like you live it. Then you'll start to see them intersect. Like any of us who've coached have experienced that player who like, they just have this like nonchalant attitude. And we almost like dislike them for it. But for some reason, they're just super consistent. Like, they're nonchalant and they're like, whatever. And they're like, I don't care. But they just seem to be the same. Like warm up, no warm up, match, no match. They're just like, you know what you're getting with that one. And we could totally learn from that. Like we can learn from that ability to be able to keep things in perspective. In perspective, none of this stuff is life or death. 
in perspective, none of this stuff is really changing my reality to collegiate coaches or if I'm going to start matches or whatever. Because any of us know if we're making a decision as a coach, as a player, we don't make a decision based on one performance. Like who starts is not based on how you did in one match or one practice. Like it's longevity. It's like, what have I seen from you over the last three weeks? What have I seen from you over the last three hours? What have I seen from you over the last three years? Like there's no decision that gets made because I watched you bounce one ball, especially if the next three were under the net. It's like, like that's that's today's culture right we see one thing on tiktok on instagram we're like oh that guy's gnarly it's like but it took him 65 tries to get that one thing that he posted like we don't post the errors we don't post the mistakes we don't post i can't tell you how often like one of us is in the facility doing a video and a kid fumbles something and they go don't post that and i go we're posting that like we post everything. Like the people who watch this stuff, they want to see that people are human, that people make mistakes, that people like are not robotic and Kim Kardashian, like they're not that, you know, they're, they're human beings. So that is a really important concept for all you players, all you coaches, like learn to treat things symmetrically and you will start to see your results be more symmetrical. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I would have to say I always treat it different. You know, it's like, I always feel like I have to succeed at this level or I have to win this tournament that I prepared for, you know, and like, you're always so stressed about it then, you know? And so yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Tournaments are totally won in practice and in, in the off season, like hundred percent. That's why like the favorites win so often, right? Like all oh, the Lakers, they have LeBron James and Anthony Davis. Like they're the favorite. Yeah. They're going to win. Like, because it's done in the off season. Like it's transactions. It's the work LeBron's been putting in for 16 years. It's not like LeBron got gnarly during the playoffs and got hot. Like you see Jamal Murray. Oh, he's killing it. He's on a new level. Yeah. Well, you're going to run into like old consistent guy. Like that's sports. So the more you can work on your consistency and providing the same product, the more success you're going to have. Any more questions, peeps? Okay, so uh, would it be valuable to you guys if we shared some drills and some skills um, that we do pretty frequently? Okay, so uh, Coach Ashley and I will demo for you guys. Uh, Coach Lynn will narrate if we're too far from the camera for you guys to be able to hear. And we're just gonna show you guys in the camera uh, some things that we'd recommend. Uh, you guys can write down whatever resonates with you, uh, ask whatever questions you have, and Lynn will, will relay it back to us that way. So. <laughs> See if we can get these bones working. All right. So something that is really important for me to start with uh, too frequently, one, I think it's always important to have teams warm up, but sidebar from that, a lot of people try to get straight into skills and they wonder why their teams aren't consistent when they start. So for me, I really think it's important to have your team warm up mentally with something challenging. So every practice, whether it's like a volleyball related skill or not, I like to add in, whether it's 30 seconds or five minutes, of something that they're not comfortable with. I like the idea of practices starting with discomfort because how often have we been in, especially with club coaches, you go to like a cold gym that's kind of far away, your team is like playing totally out of character. You're down, like you're not really sure what to do. To me, a lot of that can be alleviated by every, every day of them like starting practices with discomfort. So um, I recommend, I'll give you guys three drills you can use and start using with your team. The first is uh, juggling a ball. So if you could give them a ball, this helps with their foot skills and also warms up their brains to something challenging and a lot of them will be bad at it when they start but give them 30 seconds and try and juggle like a volleyball because like even myself who I probably practice this every day like it's not something that I can do consistently all the time and I didn't play much soccer as a kid but because I do this with my teams like when they do it I've become okay you know and so for me it's not for me to be able to kick balls in the match or whatever it's just something that makes me feel like, oh, I can try new things that I haven't done and have some success. So I would recommend that. 
I like to do like football routes. So like Coach Ashley will like bend around his blue cone, like run under the net. And this kind of warms up the shoulders. So I'll try to hit her in stride. And then like if I were in front of her, I would run and she would throw to me and try to hit me in stride. So that's built for like teamwork and just people having to think about new concepts. Like we're gonna work together to be able to create a goal. Um, and then ball control, if your team just like straight up isn't ready for that stuff because they're not good at volleyball and you have like an hour to practice and you need all volley stuff. A lot of one arm contacts uh, for me, it, it's challenging for newer players and it really develops ball control. So almost every day the athletes who work with me, like one arm contacts is something they do. So being able to control the ball with one limb and what makes the drill more challenging is when the ball has to come lower. So if you have kids who start like this, like up high, they're like, oh, I can do it, coach. This isn't even hard. Be like, okay, now make every ball go below your waist. And like they have to let it come down and then they'll go like this kind of thing. And then you go, okay, now every ball that you touch has to go above the height of your head. And then this one like totally stumps them if they're cocky about it. So it has to go below the waist come above the head. It's like really challenging to control that for newer players. So anything that you can make them feel like kind of goofy or not very good with is great to start practices with challenges. Um, you hear all the time that serving and passing wins matches. And to me, people still don't spend enough time on it. But a setting is a big deal too. So. I, I feel like so many games are given away on the fact that teams can't set. And I don't mean primary setters, because primary setters can't set a lot of times too. But your secondary setters or out of system setters really need to be able to set the ball for you to win long rallies. Like for you to have less balls that get bumped over or free balled over, everybody on your team should learn how to set. And they don't necessarily have to learn how to hand set. You can if you want to, but setting is something that very few teams work on that makes or breaks matches to me at every level. So I would always intro your practices with something uh, uncomfortable and then something related to either setting or blocking, because um, blocking is a pretty undertrained skill too, but read blocking. But setting is pretty massive, especially at the lower level. So any of you all um, who are coaching, uh, some simple drills you can do, whether you have like a bunch of courts or one court, is obviously partner setting. So we won't do that very long, but just for the sake of demonstration. Uh, setting back and forth is a good drill, right? Where you can talk to them about specific things. So what could be more challenging is if you start to mix up what kind of footwork they're allowed to use. So if they're just setting the ball back and forth, if you have a really high level team and you can get them focused, great. But if they're like, again, you kind of deal with this crew who's like, we already can do this. Where's the bouncing? Where's the, where's the whatever? Like then change it up to things that they're not capable of. Like, okay, everybody has to alternate going right, left, right, and then left, right, left. And like, see if they can get it. So if Coach Ashton and I are gonna go, we'll have to alternate our footwork. Back and forth, she'll go right, left, right. I'll go right, left, right. She'll go left, right, left. <laughs> Left, right, left. She knows that one. It feels kind of funky. So you got to go with both footworks and you test them and see you know, if they can pull it off, switching it up. That way, maybe add a little bit of interest. And then platform setting or hand setting, a great drill we like to do is just have one play. You could do this with like 12 kids or three kids. One person stand at the net and they have their choice of bouncing the ball or lobbing it into the air. And the other player will just move their feet like in a mask and they'll like run to the ball and then they'll set it like an out of system ball high that way. So if our coach Ashley's partner, say she chose middle back, I would like bounce it and she would set it back to me. Okay, same thing, we just go reps. She's just working on that like in on situation. I have to set the ball. Maybe instead of bouncing, I toss it sometimes. And she has to find ways to set the ball to me. Okay, working on her out of system setting. We can switch. She can do the same thing. That's a simple.
simple one that doesn't take a lot of space. I call it out of system partner setting or partner setting out of system. That's a really good one. Obviously, like if you have a primary setter during that time, they can be working on like proving or like setting in system stuff or medium path stuff. Um, do you guys have any questions on like intro drills? Are you curious about like, oh, I need like hitting drills or I need passing, defense, whatever. Okay. I'll say for me as a coach, I'm always willing to learn other drills because I know some coaches get into, like, for example, the varsity coach that I'm working under right now, he ran like six practices the exact same. And I about lost my mind because it was just doing the same drill for 30 minutes the entire time. And I feel personally like changing up the drills and giving kids different ways where they don't feel like they're always working on the same passing technique over and over. Um, it helps them be like, oh, I didn't realize I was working on that passing technique again for the 10th day in a row. So any drills, I'm always down for learning. Okay. Yeah. And on that conversation, um, I literally wrote up, this is like, uh, my experiences allow me to be fairly multifaceted. That's why I've been fortunate to be in the position I've been in for like a lot of people to reach to me for coaching stuff. But I, I could give you like pros and cons for any situation. Uh, to me, it's all about framing, you know, how you're able to frame for you guys as athletes. So I can tell you um, in two, experience, two positive experiences I've had, I've had a team win a gold medal where the whole season, lit, no exaggeration, literally, we ran the same exact practice every single day for a whole club practice. Um, and then I've had a team win a gold medal where – every single day was different like it was new rotations new drills new systems new ideologies like and the reason why i would choose one versus the other or why one versus the other could be valuable is the exact same reason like and that that's just consistency like if you can get a team to buy into this concept of we're going to do the same exact thing every day and you're going to become so good at it that no one will be able to stop you like, and you have the athletes who can perform that and they have the mental capacity and they like want it really bad. And usually this is with younger people. Like you can't, it's tough to get older people to buy into that, but younger people, if you can get them young enough, they'll like drive it home for you. You know, if you could coach it up the right way, but on the other end, and to me, there is such thing as being good enough at a couple skills where like, it's just hard to beat. Like, especially at a young age, if you can like pass the ball to the same spot, set the ball to the same spot, hit the ball to two spots. Like it's hard to stop, you know, at, at a certain level, but the benefit to having that, that change up is there is a little bit of breath of fresh air kind of feeling with it. Like, okay, something new. Okay. I'm learning new stuff yet. It, there is a, a dangerous tipping point to me where like some people get to the point where everything's important. And you guys have all heard that old cliche. Like if everything's important, nothing's important, you know, like, to me, there, there is a benefit to having foundation. So you guys as coaches, that's the beauty. Nobody has to follow anybody else's system, but I would want you guys to all find a couple different systems, not one, a couple systems that work for you where you feel like I could get the most out of a group. And this really uh, accentuates my greatest qualities as a coach. Like for me, I have, I have a lot of confidence as a coach. So I feel like I could just, I could make a champion out of anybody. Like that's my natural feeling. Like give me a girl, give me a boy, give me older, give me younger, give me less kids, more kids, small gym, big gym. Like I'll make it happen. But what, with what, with most coaches, what I find is their lack of confidence in themselves and their, their words and their system is what is their undoing. Like, to me, what I said, this is like a statement I make most frequently. The system does not matter. Having a system matters. So I literally, literally feel like I could teach my team to pass with their feet and we could be good. But I would have to commit to it and like train it and not go away from it in the challenging moments when it's like, not working out so great. Like I would have to believe in it and they'll believe in it. Cause honestly, that's how any new record is broken, right? Like imagine Steph Curry, like I'm going to shoot 402 threes and make them. And like, imagine saying that 20 years ago, people would be like, 
that that's stupid and crazy and low percentage. And now it's like the way the NBA is run. It's, you know, every, every sport changes because there's somebody bold enough to come in and say like, I'm going to switch this up. When swing blocking first became a thing, we're going to swing our arms to get higher. And people were like, no, that's out of control. That's crazy. That's low percentage. You should shuffle block. And now everybody shuffle box, setting fast offense. No, you need to set the ball up high so hitters can always hit it. And there's no miscommunication or miss. It's like now everybody wants to run the fast offense. It's like things change because somebody was bold enough, you know, to switch it up. So um, I realized that wasn't a question, but I, it, to me, it's important to share perspective. Like the, the most you guys will learn from these things is when you hear stories of like things that worked or didn't work. And it sounds like Coach Ashley has something to say. Um, yeah, Chris joked earlier at the beginning that uh, you don't run a 4-2 unless you're me. And I've done that actually with two different teams because I didn't have middles. So I put my setters in that middle spot and taught them to pull tip coverage and taught my blockers, um, you know, how to block solo. Um, but I think just don't be afraid to be creative and to fail. And like when you're thinking about new drills or different drills, like think about the deficiencies in your team and how you want to develop those. So like in my 4-2 last year, we needed to work on more cut shots from both pins. So I created an over the net pepper where it was just two partners on both sides and they were just repping that out back and forth. And it's not something I've ever seen in my 14 years of volleyball experience, but it's something that helped us develop that shot while giving them the freedom and creativity to just kind of flow and figure it out um, without fear of failure. All right, so we're gonna show you guys a couple more drills. So uh, good partner drills. Um, for me, what I see most often that really challenges me as a coach, AKA like makes me annoyed, is when I see really sloppy habits during warmups. Because to me, sloppy habits during warmups translate to sloppy habits during the match. And then people are always wondering like why the product looks the way it does because they allow people to do whatever during the warmup. So uh, for me, I like to train every skill individually on its own so that there's no question like, oh my, like you, we've all heard kids make excuses. Like, oh, first pass of the day. Oh, for, oh, the, the, the light, the, oh, the whatever. <laughs> like if, if every tr skill is trained quickly, but efficiently, there's no excuse. Like, oh, I didn't the first pass of the day. No, it wasn't. Like you passed in the warm up. You locked in the warm up. You hit in the warm up. I try to get every skill in. So you guys as coaches, uh, this is how I do the math, and I'd write this down. If you have a practice that's over 45 minutes long, you should be able to get in all seven skills of volleyball. And that would be serving, passing, blocking, digging, hitting, setting, and covering. It, practice over 45 minutes, you should be able to get in all seven skills. And that is like – your skills don't have to be like, I'm doing a full tutorial on them. Like blocking could be three minutes. Hey, like you got, everybody's going to get on the line. You're going to do this hand position. I want you guys to go under the net. Then I want you to go over the net. And then you're going to do three shuffles out. That's our blocking for the day. We improved. We learned something. We, whatever. You don't have to do full on like six on six read block, ball setter, ball hitter. Like, and I want you guys to realize that as coaches, as long as it's touched, there will be an awareness. So if you guys communicate that coverage is a thing, like, hey, every day when we do pepper, like, it doesn't matter if you guys never play six on six. Every day when we do pepper, we're gonna do a version where a hitter hits, the other person digs, then the person sets themselves, and the other player comes over and says, cover, and they tip it to the person and they cover it, and that's a drill. Do that five times each. So they're like, oh, frick, like in the game, we've talked about coverage. Like, I need to know that's a thing. Like, your team needs to be aware of all the skills so that they can compete, you know, at any level. So we're going to show you a couple partner drills, maybe beyond your standard pepper that you should consider doing. So first thing, I really honestly am way into, like, simple contacts first. So Coach Ash is going to set, and I'm going to pass my platform. We're just going to go back and forth. She'll set, I'll platform pass. One in front of me, yep. I'll more pass, and I'm just working footwork. Okay, you guys talk to your athletes about simple footwork, maybe one step, that's all they get. Everybody's taking one step, okay, trying to track the ball. 
Alright, everybody's taking three steps. He's trying to track the ball. No matter what, no matter how far it is. Three steps. So they start to learn the difference. Like they can feel it in themselves. Alright, everybody's gotta do a knee drop now. Say, I'll put Jasper still setting. I'll take the knee drop. So everybody's gotta drop their inside knee. Okay, fast. Okay, now the other knee. And like you can see that feels kind of funky for me. So they need to learn like how to get uncomfortable, okay, so that they can eventually have comfort. And then say, like, we got through some platforms and hand stuff, so we switched, I do the same thing. Different shoulder warm-ups. I like doing the same thing every day so that there's consistency, and arm swing to me is, like, a very important thing. And in our next seminar, we'll go over kind of the technique, the simple technique I would use for all these things. But I like overhand throws, but you see all people do all sorts of stuff. So just different ways people can throw the ball to move their shoulders. Maybe these are things you've seen. Maybe you haven't. And then I like three different types of tosses um, for situations. Work on your jump spin serve. I like a ball with top spin. Work on hitting higher balls um, that don't spin, like from a setter. Two hand toss. Work on hitting the, the float serve or like a lower toss. One hand, no spin toss. Like, to me, people need to understand the different ways that the ball will come to them and definitely don't want them warming up their arm like this. If you have players who warm their arm like this, my recommendation is you change that, okay? Like that, none of that is a situation they will simulate in a match. Hitting from the face on a toss this high. I like height to the toss because that simulates how things will work in a match. The hitter has to time the ball and like work on their hand-eye coordination for the ball hitting their hand. So that's big to me. And then sometimes hitting balls that have spin, sometimes hitting balls that don't have spin, that's really important too, because those are the different ways they'll have to hit a ball that matches. So we'll do a couple back and forth. Bounce off the ground. I like people to get into a race. They finish hitting, it's a good practice. So they hit, they get ready, showing the match, they're ready to cover. I think we might have proposed that the state we'll see. Like my team's like they hit, they open, they don't open when they get to the next side. Bye, sorry, sorry. Okay, so you guys all know Pepper, like big set hit, but here's some variations that can be fun, you know, if you have a team that's at a high level or a lower level. So say Coach Ashton, I have already done big set hit type of pepper. Next thing could be three contacts. To yourself so dig to yourself set yourself hit to your partner but rather than it just being like joe schmo or like whatever works really have them emphasize the technique so after they dig to themselves is it a bump set or a hand set ideally share that with them when they're hitting talk to them about getting into the actual i call it a load but the actual getting ready to hit position rather than like whatever like, the ball, you know, like the more dynamic they can learn to be, the better. So we'll demo that. So she's gonna dig to herself, hand set herself, elbow back, dig to myself, hand set myself, elbow back. This is actually a much more challenging drill than most people would let on to believe. Like most people, even in college, can't perform this drill. I don't know how many can perform the whole box. There's not many who can perform this in college, so a good drill to work out that way. Another drill that's similar to that, that works on having to have even more control, is your choice of two or three contacts. So dig to yourself, set yourself, hit, or dig to yourself and then hit on two. That requires a lot of ball control, and if the ball is spinning backwards off your platform, the hitter would have to learn how to change the spin on the ball to get it going forward. So this is harder for a lot of newer players. Okay, so we have our choice. Maybe she did set hits. I would have to dig and then hit to change the spin on that ball. Right? So keep going. I'll dig and I'll hit. Dig, hit, dig, set, hit. And they have their choice that way. Okay, working on being able to control it, and honestly, it makes the game move faster. So, like, if your team's not very good at like digging dumps or reacting to like a faster offense, 
a drill like that totally makes them have to like make decisions quicker and they don't get to get into this lackadaisical uh, routine. And then the final drill we show is what I notice with a lot of teams at a lower level, especially, is they become good enough or they get hot at digging the driven ball, but they're not very good at digging like tips or the easy ball or multi-step. Like anybody who's coached volleyball has totally been in the atmosphere where they've heard this, tip, and then the ball hits the ground. Like anybody who's coached volleyball has had that happen. So we want to try to create multi-step moves every day. Like that's a big thing for me, defensively, so receive wise, setting, hitting, of course, but multi-steps are like really important to ball control. And that's where I see teams break down. Like they're great when the other team's best hitter is ripping and one of their diggers gets hot and they're scooping and the team's stoked, but then like they drop a tip in the middle of the court and it scores and the team's frustrated. So trying to add in multi-steps with the pepper, there's two ways that are really good to do that. So regular pepper, where I would hit to Coach Ashley, and then she would dig to me, I would set her, she would tip it, I would come dig it, and then I would have to retreat back really quickly. And then come that way. So you don't want to give them a time of like just running. Like, I try to get them to like stop. And then the next rest of that drill, like where you can hit or tip. So they have to hit eight. All right, makes sense. So that makes it have to be a little bit more live and realistic. So partner drills, uh, everybody does them, but I don't see enough dynamic action. And what I mean by that is people making sure that technique is still a point of focus within their partner drills rather than it just being backyard barbecue. Or two, there being different variations so that like we were talking about earlier, people don't just become good enough at the routine of, oh, I can dig a ball that hits my platform because I know this partner who I partner with every day is arm swing, but then we get in the match and I can't read this random person's arm swing and now I stink. So switching up partners, switching up drills, changing up the flow, that's where you guys' creativity can take over. Oh. Okay. So you guys have any questions, comments, concerns about that? A quick one. Um, Hold on, you're muted, say it again. Um, just a quick one, um, I think, uh, about the dropping of the knees. Um, uh, when you're, just to add that discomfort, uh, when do you do that? Oh, so knee drops would be for situations where Either A, you're not going to be on balance uh, from staying on your feet. So like if I were running towards you guys from here, and like I wanted to play the ball, but I would probably play it like this, yeah, and, like off balance, a choice I have is to drop my knee and create stability. So the knee would act like my leg, but it allows me to be at a lower point than being in this uncomfortable spot. Does that uh, make sense? So I would use it usually for shorter balls, uh, but essentially the best way I can describe it is if you're trying to create stability in a situation where you would not otherwise have stability. Dude, I think I think it's crazy that for a long time, like I think that's yeah, I see that happening all the time. But it's one of the changes in the game that like people realize it's really good, huh? For sure, for sure. The knee drop, like anybody at a high level, if you go watch the Brazilians play, oh, the United States pass, like you'll see a lot of pictures, like beach indoor. The knee drop for stability is huge, especially when the velocity of the ball picks up. Anybody else? Oh, it was also, sorry. Uh, it was also really like hard to see when you were, um, uh, I think it's my internet, when you were covering. So when you're working on the covering during pepper, do you just like 
you just I'm just gonna preface it like you said, but like you just like go like that, and then the guy just goes short to like cover a to cover. So to be clear, are you talking about cover an attacker? Or are you talking about cover a spot defensively? Cover an attacker into so, a ball. So here's my generic. If any of you guys want to write this down for coverage, I like for my closest coverage person to be three feet away from the action and slightly below a 25% bend. So anybody on my team, that would be like, they understand what I'm talking about. If that sounds like Spanish to you, three feet away from where the ball is being hit. So you don't want to be so close that the, the hitter is going to like trip on you. And mm -hmm. also like the ball gets on you too fast. If you're like that close, like it gets blocked and it's like in on you. So you want to give yourself space to be able to react. Um, and then below a 25% bend. So I talk about bending in percentages. To me, straight up uh, doesn't allow you athleticism. And yeah. anything that gets below your knee is going to score. 25% is pretty good for like setting and blocking. Anything where you're going to want to end up upright. 50% is like uncomfortable and like really challenging to get out of. 75% is like not possible. So slightly below a 25% bend allows you to touch the floor. For most people, with arms, and then it allows you to also make any kind of upward movement you need to, like for transition. So three feet away from the hitter, and slightly below a twenty-five percent bend. That would be my uh, advice. Who's that? So hard to hear. She left. Oh. Oh, I, I, she, he cleared it up. Okay. Cool. Anybody else? All right, so great first seminar. We're gonna do these once a month. You guys look out for the next email. Be communicating in the meantime. That's an open thread to say, hey, this is something I wanna hit. This is something that uh, came across my plate this week. Uh, I'd appreciate if you guys did this in the next seminar. And if you guys know people who it, this would be valuable to, uh, make sure to invite them. Obviously, you guys know our email and uh, you're on all the Instagram, Setter College, Volleyball Lessons, Lynn Answers, all those uh, consistently. Did you have more, Lynn? No. You have anything, Coach? Nope. You guys have anything? Okay, check it out. If you guys use the code on Setter College website, seminar, you get $10 off of any of the Setter College gear. So if you guys want to use that at any time, you're more than welcome. It'll be there. All right. All right, we will see you guys next time. Appreciate you.